Thank you everyone for joining us today here online and in person for the next session of our entrepreneur, or excuse me, our founder university series. Today, we're going to be discussing uh, markets and competitors. And today, our very own Maggie is a speaker, and she'll be covering Tam Sam Som, knowing your competitors. This is pretty critical for a founder to know what the potential is of the market and whether it's really worth their time to go on and, and get the, you know, start on the roller coaster that is the startup and entrepreneur journey. We'll look at competitors as well, um, and uh, you do have them. Uh, and even if it's just the status quo, we'll dive into how to make an assessment of those. As I mentioned, Maggie is a founding team member of Startup NVE. She's a mentor, investor, and er expert in early stage uh, ventures, pitch decks, and market research. I'm pretty sure Maggie's seen probably a thousand pitch decks and hundreds of pitches by now. So she knows uh, how critically important market sizing and proper competitive research is. And additionally, she is a regular uh, volunteer in numerous community organizations, uh, some of them such as the Barracuda Championship and One Million Cups, which many of you have probably heard of. You know, thank you for joining us, Maggie, as always. And, and, uh, and I'll pass it to you now. It's up to you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's fun to be here. And um, I was hoping to be there in person, but it just didn't work out this time. So we will plunge ahead. Um, Tam Sam Som and markets, that's one of my favorite topics because it's critical to know and most people don't do it right. And there's there's probably just a lack of understanding and how to do it. So we're gonna fix that today. Okay. Usually I just do Tam, Sam, and Sam, but we're gonna throw in some competition this time. What is Tam, Sam, and Sam? And it is <clears throat> understanding your market. And you need to understand which <clears throat> category your product or service falls into. And then we need to narrow it so that we can get an idea of how big the potential is for your business. But before we talk about particulars, I want to appeal to you to really understand this for yourself. If you are hopping on this roller coaster that is a startup, you should understand what the potential is. If you want to go public, is that a possibility? You have to have a very large market in order to become a public company. If you wanna have a lifestyle business where it pays you a very nice income, that is a completely different level of market. But before you embark on this journey, you should understand what the potential upside is. And you can do that by understanding what your marketplace is. So TAM is the total addressable market. And that is if all the people in all the world can buy your product or service, that's what the sales figure would be. It also includes the tangential parts of your market. And we'll get into specific examples a little bit later that'll help to illustrate this. And then SAM is your serviceable available market. So this is cutting it down from that huge market to a more local market that is something that you can strive for. By understanding SAM, it actually de-risks it for the investor because they, instead of being like the whole world, they can say, okay, well, within 10 years, if they penetrated SAM, then we would have an idea of what the income will be. And SOM is your obtainable market. And I get very specific about this, and I'm not sure that a lot of other people do. But what we want to see at Startup and B for your SOM is what your actual sales projection is for a time-bound period. And we're talking about three to five years. So this in itself, this SOM takes a tremendous amount of work on your part to actually figure out what your costs are, what your plans are for expansion, where you're going to spend money on advertising so that you can make a sales projection for three to five years. It's not easy. Now on the left, we have a stacked Venn diagram. This is the easiest way to depict Tam, Sam, and Sam. They're um, smaller circles within circles, and that indicates that these are subsets of the larger circle above it. So, but again, for, for Sam, we do want your sales projection for your business. 
And why is this important? Understanding the market size is important for many, many different types of investors. And so I just grabbed this slide that shows these different investors from that are different size, like some are individual angels, some are actual VCs, and some are people who are just going to support the startups that are in their field that they like. But all of them have market opportunity or market size as a piece of information that they absolutely want to see in a pitch deck, and they usually want to see it pretty early. So this is an important piece of information in your deck. Why do we need this information? Okay, Tam, as I said, it gives context for everything, for the whole world. The investors are interested in this, especially if it's um, a market that is growing. So if you're growing at a compound annual growth rate, CAGR, uh, more than 5%, then this is an expanding market. Um, as I said earlier, the available market de-risks it by bringing it into focus in a closer time frame than the whole wide world. And it's generally, Sam is generally one to 10% of the total market. And then we get to some, again, it's a realistic view for what you can do in three to five years. If you project six years, that's fine, eight years, whatever. As long as you are able to explain and defend what you've chosen to depict. There are different ways to calculate it, um, but I'm here to tell you that it's, it's not easy and it can be expensive. So there, you know, if there were a Fortune 500 company and they were thinking about acquiring a business in a new field to them, then they would hire an external research group like Gartner or Forrester, and they would have them do a complete analysis of the marketplace. This is not feasible for startup people. Okay, there are some places where you can find research, App Annie, the business of apps. If you're planning on doing an application, these are places where you can buy research that they have already done. Uh, top down, just to get like very basic TAM information, you can find that online from the UN, the World Bank, CIA World Factbook. Bottom up, here you start with your first market. And I want to caution you because I've seen a lot of people who do bottom up all the way to the top, and that is not acceptable. Okay, the first two numbers, TAM and SAM, should absolutely be research based. And they should be dollars. How big is the current marketplace? What is the world spending on this particular market? Okay, those pieces of information for TAM and SAM can be found with databases. And I have resources, resources for you at the end of this. So um, IBIS World, Statista, BizMiner, these are all databases that um, are subscription-based. So they do cost money but we have a few resources where they will do it for you for free. Um, but it depends on the quality of the questions that you ask, whether you get quality information out of it. All right, so we're gonna visit some examples and we're actually going to look at real life examples that I've seen in decks that we've reviewed. But these are the ones that make it relatable for, for you guys, because everybody's heard of Uber. Now, when Uber first pitched to investors back in 2007, they picked their TAM as the transpor transportation marketplace. And so worldwide, that was 5.7 trillion. And that included water freight, um, train freight, every kind of transportation that there is, air cargo, okay? And then for their available market, they looked at taxi and limousines in the United States. Okay, so 4.2 billion was what was made up of the taxi and the limousine. So we went from 5.7 trillion to 4.2 billion as their larger market. So this de-risked it for the investors. They knew how, how big a pond they were playing in. And then for their own obtainable market, they gave three different versions, a best case, a realistic case, and then a worst case. 
So their best case would they would be the market leader in this new way of providing transportation and get to a billion in yearly revenue. Okay, he was a big thinker. All right, realistically, they were hoping to get 5% of the taxi and limousine market that existed in the top five cities. And then for their worst case, they would just remain a 10 car, 100 client service in San Francisco. So we all know how that kind of went, but let me just give you some numbers. So the Uber revenue in 2020 was 11.14 billion. Their valuation was 73.7 billion. And they have expanded into other areas that were not included in transportation. For example, food delivery. That was not actually considered in transportation, the 5.7 trillion. So they've moved into other areas as well. And they're also including um, scooters and other types of transportation. In 2022, their revenue was 31.87 billion and their market cap was 62.8 billion. So that's a success story. They were very realistic when they started though. Okay, Airbnb, we've all heard of Airbnb. Maybe we don't all know why it's called Airbnb. They started off with the notion, they lived in San Francisco and they know how crowded it got when a convention came to town. And so their idea to pay their own rent was to inflate an air mattress and try to get somebody to, to take this air mattress in a room and rent it during a convention. So that's why it's called Airbnb. It actually started with air mattresses. So they were looking, they figured that the people who were willing to rent an air mattress were not luxury travelers. So they, to get to their Tam Sam and Son, they looked at 1.9 billion trips booked. The budgeted online trips were going to be their people, right? Air mattresses on the floor. So that was 532 million. And they figured that they could capture about 10.6 million of those trips. Okay, so now, so far they haven't been dealing with income or spend. So to translate that to income and spend, they took their 10.6 million possible trips, their goal, and they figured their fee was gonna be $20, average fee based on $70 a night for three nights, you know, a convention. And that would yield $200 million in revenue. And they put this into a pitch deck back in 2008 or so. And so the current stats on Airbnb, uh, they went public in December of 2020. On their first IPO day back in 2020, their valuation was 100 billion. And since then, they have uh, 2022, their revenue was 8.4 billion and their market cap is 71 billion. Another success story. It's, um, you know, they've had pain along the way, but that is the nature of a startup. All right. So here I also wanted to depict and to show you how to think about a multi-sided marketplace. When you're creating a marketplace where you're bringing providers of a process or good with purchasers of a process or good, you have two sides that you have to market to. And so being the person in the middle, it's a little bit harder to try to figure out what your TAM and SAM and SOM are. So the way to think about it is to try to hone in on how you fit into this. So this um, multi-sided marketplace example was for a company that was going to be offering custom apparel that was only available online. Okay, so they didn't have to worry about overhead and brick and mortar stores. So in order to figure out what their market might be, they looked at custom clothing designs and they looked at the Tam Sam and Sam of that, that was all researched. Then they went into custom clothing manufacturing, which is their subset because it's going to be customized apparel. And they got the Tam Sam Sam there. And then they went to look at what it currently is online. And so from this, they were able to develop a logical Tam, Sam, and Som, because it's almost like there was Tam, 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 right? All the different aspects of what they're doing and Sam, Sam, Sam. So they had to then create what their Som might be. Okay, so this, it's harder to do that. 
no question. All right, let me give you another example. <clears throat> this was a, a couple of guys who lived in New York City and they were rabid sports fans and they wanted to be able to um, provide jerseys for fans like them. So they went to Yankee Stadium and they actually did research. So the first part was um, how big is the universe? And for them, they picked the five major sports and they went to see how many Americans were watching. Okay, this was their pool of potential customers. And then how many can they reach with their sales channel? So they just were going to start with New York City. And then again, they focused on those same five major teams. And then to test their theory, they went to Yankee Stadium over a couple of different games and they polled people and they would talk to anybody that they could get in front of. And so they talked to women, they talked to men, they thought when they went in that their target market were going to be season ticket holders because they're the ones that are shelling out the big bucks to be able to go to every game. But they talked to everybody that they could meet and they discovered some really interesting stuff. They discovered that it wasn't necessarily the season ticket holders that would be interested in renting a jersey. And they offered their idea. What if we could give you a jersey of your favorite player and you could wear it for the whole season? Okay, and so some people said, yeah, what would you charge for it? So they did a little polling about what the cost would be. But they talked to people who were not season ticket holders and they said, yeah, I, you know, I go to two games a year and I'd love to have a uh, shirt for the times that I go. So, ah, now we have a different sales channel. And what surprised them was that women were just as interested as having jerseys as the men were. So I took the last slide and reworked it into a stacked Venn diagram. So the TAM for the Americans who watched the five major sports was 150 million people. Again, we're not dealing with spend yet. And then in New York, it was 11 million New Yorkers. And then through their research, they figured they had about 1.3 million enthusiastic people. So what about the spend? How do we actually get it into Tam, Sam, and Sam? So they took their 1.3 million potential customers and uh, through their research, they discovered that 60% of them would do it one time and 40% would buy for the season. They also had a contingency that if your favorite player got swapped out to a different team, you could swap your jersey. And you didn't have to wash it even, you just sent it back to them and they cleaned it and sent you a new one. So this, based on the fees that they came with, or they decided on, a one-time rental was gonna be $50 and the whole season would be 250. And so they just extrapolated that. So the one-time users would bring in 39 million and the season holders would bring in 130 million for a total sum projected revenue of 169 million in New York in three years, okay? And that was just one market. So where would they go next? Boston, of course, where else would they go? But they could do this same sort of research and same calculation for each city that they plan to penetrate. All right, now we're gonna go on to some examples. And I have both good examples and bad examples. So let's start with the poor ones. This was the actual Tam Sam Saw market slide for a company that wanted to create a brand new sport. And so they were looking at all of the spend on the sports industry of being $73 billion. And then they just sort of arbitrarily decided that they could make 7.79 billion in six years. There was no basis for this, they could not explain it. So the point to remember about this is that when you are putting your TAM, SAM and SOM together, you want to be able to logically explain it to an investor. How did you get to these numbers? Here's another sports company. This was a company that wanted to provide training for sports people by known athletes. 
And so this was a, a group of guys who one were gamers and they were also um, hockey players. And so they thought they had some connections in these areas where they could get professional gamers to give advice. And also they knew a few hockey players that they could get to do that. So this was their market and this was what they gave us in terms of what they thought they could do. So they told us how many youth athletes were playing hockey, 54 million, and there were 1.8 million total gamers interested in competitive play. So this is market information, but it does not draw any conclusions and it does not make any projections. And so it really does not give enough information to an investor to make any sort of assessment about what kind of potential this company has for making revenue. <clears throat> this company had a cooling phone case. It was really interesting looking, but I feel like they didn't quite finish their research. So they started with the mobile phone accessories market. Perfect. That's understandable. It's a nice big figure. Then they took it for the available market. They went to the protection cover market. Also very logical. I'm following right along here. I don't have any problem. So 29.6 billion. Okay, then there's the global untapped market for innovating protective cover. And they don't even make a guess. And they also have a spelling error here on the last little blurb. Competitors is spelled wrong. So they started doing good research. They just didn't take it quite far enough. And it would be a major question that an investor would ask. Well, what do you think your revenue is going to be? You may as well just answer the question with the slide. Now we have some good examples. Okay. This is from a company that wanted to provide on the spot hair care services. So they were willing to come to you. So they started off with the barbershops and the beauty salons and what the current, and actually this was probably from 2021. So it was probably a little bit of projection also for 2022 and 2023. So 107 billion for TAM. And then for Sam, they got to 34 billion. And I don't remember what their breakdown was, um, how they got to that amount. But they figured that in California, where people are very interested in their appearance, that they would be able to raise 80 million in three or four years, up until 2024. So how would they go about making this logically explainable? And my suggestion was, okay, it's not a directly related field, but it gives an indication of the subset of people who are willing to pay for services to come to them. Let's look, look at car washes. The people who are willing to, or the percentage of people, people who would normally get their car wash, but were willing to pay extra to have the car wash come to them, either at their workplace or at their home. If you could do a percentage analysis of the people who do get their car washed versus the people who are willing to pay for it to come to them in California, this would be a logical way to figure out what the percentages might be. All right, another good example, and the reason that I like this example is because it's completely thorough. It may not be strong on drawing conclusions, but it covers all of the possible competition. So this particular company had a very expensive, very high end bed that would rotate the person in the bed. So you didn't have to toss and turn. The bed would actually change your position. And so he looked at everything that you could sleep on from <clears throat> just basic beds to very adjustable beds to inflatable beds. He looked at the mattress industry, the bed and mattress, and the bedding and furniture industry. He looked also, because he thought there was an application for medical as well, and so he looked at the different types of beds that they have in the hospitals. So that was a separate market for him. And then he also even included what would people be using if they tried to take care of themselves at home? 
And so he has this big set of information about all the different types of sleeping equipment. Um, he did go on to project what um, his psalm would be uh, based on his very expensive bed and also on the fact that there would be a very small market who could afford it. All right, here is another company who was doing telemedicine. This was a couple years ago, um, probably during COVID when it was so kind of new, but becoming mainstream. So they knew that they wanted to start in Las Vegas. And so they went to the, <clears throat> they did research. They knew that it was 55.9 billion in the global telemedicine. They cut it down to the US market size. And then based on the population and the penetration that they thought they could get, um, they put in 40 million. And I forget what the time frame was. I think it was five years. So this is very logical, very easy to understand. Okay, now for my absolute favorite market slide I've ever seen. This was from a company that makes soap and fragrance products. So they have lotions, they have soap, they have this like perfume, the solid perfume type stuff. And this was their slide. What's beautiful about this is that it's like really easy to understand. 8% of Americans and it's a $3 billion market. It's the narration that goes with this that makes it so great. So this um, owner would say our total addressable market includes 20 million military members, both active and veterans, 17 million REI members, and more than 1 million Harley Davidson riders. And then they also have a market for the 1 million people who go to annual festivals, like, um, I'm not gonna think of it, but the, the one that's in Southern California, the big music festival. So in total, they reach 39 million Americans, which is 8% of the population. And then they say how they're going to reach the population. They know what their cost per acquisition is. And so they're able to project what their income is going to be. So down at the bottom, they summarize it. It's 1.8 billion personal care market plus the 66, 664 million personal fragrance market plus home fragrance. And so it's a total of a $3 billion market. And this is the gal who first said, you bet your butt that I did this research because I knew it was going to be an eight to 10 year process. And I wanted to make sure that it was a big enough market that I wouldn't be wasting my time. So just to recap, Tam is the big picture. Sam is a more local picture and your specific target market. And then Sam is your sales projection of what you think you can obtain in three to five years. And these numbers should be in dollars. If you want to give context by talking about the number of users you may have, you can do that as long as you have a slide that has what the dollar values are. All right, so let's talk about competition. As Logan said, you have competition. Don't tell me that you don't. Your competition may be status quo. Maggie, and, please, yes. do you mind if we take some questions related to Tam Sam Som real quick before we move on to competition? I don't mind at all. All right, excellent. So a couple of questions here that have um, come up, but a couple of them you've actually answered through the course of the presentation. Um, it, from Robert, it seems like Uber's Tam should have been 4.2 billion, the taxi and limo market, not 5.7 trillion, all transportation, which includes cars, et cetera. You know, they cut it down to like there was probably an interim level that they could have done that would have served as TAM. So TAM is all of transportation. And if you want to think about it in the broadest terms, you would probably look at the sectors that are part of the S&P 500 
those however many sectors make it up. And that would really be your starting point for TAM, SAM, and SOM, but you don't have to start there as Uber did. Uh, they could have gone into car transportation and made that their TAM instead of all of the transportation industry, but at least they understood what they meant and they were able to describe what they meant. So yes, you could be right. They could have just talked about car transportation first and then talked about their local markets or their top five cities and then what they plan to do. Gotcha. Thank you. And from this is probably really unrelated. It might, it's probably outside the scope of this. Has Uber been profitable? And David, that might be actually outside the scope of this conversation. But it definitely is because I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> they are nonetheless a very successful startup. Um, from Robert again, some markets have projections such as uh, electric vehicles, battery storage, renewable energy, but there's also an element of the Wild West or the future potential gold rush that those industries may experience. How do you state that in a TAM? Well, it, is, it should be part of your narration, but like right now, AI is big and we have no idea where it's going to fit. It could touch every aspect of our lives and we just don't know yet. This is definitely the wild west with AI, but you have to logically explain what your thinking is and then still be enthusiastic about the potential upside because we don't know where these industries are going. Excellent point. Um, and one from Kenny, uh, where do you draw the line on a TAM? For example, uh, his, uh, his TAM could be every attorney, uh, but it could just stop at personal injury attorneys. Technically, every attorney is a possibility to use his product, but where would you draw the line? Or I guess, would you say there's a, that's where you differentiate your TAM versus your SAM? Your SAM? Um, <clears throat> or SAM, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I think, I think the point I want to make with this question is you need to be honest with yourself. Okay, so you're trying not to fool yourself and you're trying not to fool investors too. So I would draw the line where it feels comfortable. I mean, an attorney who does contract law for a corporation is probably not going to be your customer. So I think you should be realistic about it. And it sounds like your SAM is actually the personal injury people. But if you want to, it, it kind of all depends on what you want your starting point to be. If, if you're in the personal injury world, that could be your TAM. And then if you're starting in Nevada, or if you're starting in Las Vegas and you're starting very local, then that can be your SAM. And then your SAM is your projection on how much of that market you're going to penetrate in three to five years. You could go personal injury with hotels, personal injury with um, just car accidents, other people hurting you, versus more where the pockets are deeper, like oil rig, hotels, uh, more commercial ships, you know, more commercial places where the companies have already planned for liability insurance. So as long as you can logically explain what makes up your TAM, SAM, and SOM, then you're good to go. But I would caution against fooling yourself into thinking that there are customers out there that really aren't out there. Great point. Um, one, uh, one. Uh, this isn't a question. I just want to say to Rick. Rick, uh, I see you've raised your hand. If you have a question or a comment, feel uh, please put that in the chat, and we'll pull from there. Thank you, uh, Maggie. I think that's everything. Uh, I'll wait for them to accumulate till the end of the, your competition uh, uh, presentation, and then we'll ask questions again. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on competition. So you can continue to ask questions about Tan, Sam, and Song, and competition. Competition is very easily researched. And so you should do that. Um, the thing that I was starting to say is like, well, you know, you have competition even if it's status quo. So when Henry Ford made the, the Model A, Model T, whichever the first one was, you know, he was competing against horses. And he was competing against the notion that the roads were made out of dirt and the cars wouldn't travel over them well. And so things will evolve. You do have to understand if your competition is just the status quo, where 
it's not a painful enough problem yet. People don't know, like AI. They don't know how much easier their life is going to be when they have an AI assistant. <clears throat> so there's a little bit of that barrier to entry. So when you're dealing with competition, you should take all of these things into consideration. One of the easiest ways to depict competition is with a rack up. And so this is from our sample slide deck. And um, the only thing I would say about this is when you're doing your competition rack up, it should take up most of the slide. Okay, so we've got some text on the side here to help you out. Um, you always wanna make sure that your company is either on the left or the right, don't put it in the middle. And because the eye is drawn to the left or to the right, and especially when you're using these types of symbols to depict how you have a particular feature and others do not. So you want to take the, the highest competitors that would be found by an investor if while you were pitching, they looked at their phone and they put in there, who makes this? You wanna make sure that the people that show up for them during your pitch are on your sheet. And if you're doing any sort of price comparison, you should make sure that you are updating this on a regular basis because uh, prices do change. So what we have here are the competitors across the top. We have the different features that we have uh, where we're different, we're a differentiation on the um, left side. And then we make giant green check marks for the things that we do well. And we make uh, little red X's for the stuff that other people don't do well. And I would even say, you'll see it later on in a different uh, example. Like the check marks don't all have to be the same size. For your competitors, you can make theirs smaller so they're not quite as noticeable. Yes, that's showmanship. All right, again, I have some examples for you. And this first one is an example that is a poor one. This is a poor example because in a slide deck, you shouldn't have anything that has this tiny text in it. And I can't really tell what it's trying to tell me. So this is just a lousy example. And it tells me that the competitors are Facebook, Meetup, and Bumble. So this is some sort of social application. But I have to re, I have to look really hard to try to figure out what's going on here. And then they thought that they were doing a good job by saying their unique advantages are they're the first in the market. All right, if their competitors are Facebook, Meetup, and Bumble, I would submit that maybe they are not the first in the market. So not, not necessarily a great slide here. This is a slide that I do like. Uh, this was um, this first one, Stern. They gave me permission to use this slide. Uh, they were making marine quality um, trailers that went on the back of a all-wheel drive Toyota. And so they're customizing it, cost $159,000. The only one that's close in price, these other guys here, um, don't have the same ability to go all wheel driving. And so you'll notice here that the green check mark under Winnebago Revel is much smaller than the green check mark underneath them. So I do like this. There's still a ton of information in here. They did us the favor of actually showing us what each one of these looks like. Uh, for this particular product, it was important to understand what they looked like. And so I do like this slide a lot. And that's all I have on competition. Told you I would give you some resources at the end. And so because Nevada has land grant universities, when the public asks for help, the university has to try to help people. So we have some research librarians at UNLV and the University of Nevada, Reno, who can help. And so I've included their information here. And through a grant, we've been able to subscribe to some of these databases that I've uh, described. And so we have Eric Slickerveer on our research and marketing team, and he is able to help people to, to do this kind of research. He's really good at doing competitive research as well as the Tam Sam Som research. Right. And I'll take any questions you have.
All right. Thank you so much, Maggie. All right. We've got a couple of questions uh, related to that. Define a rack up, which you kind of, you demonstrated an example there, but uh, is going to add any more context there? A rack up is the same thing as a matrix. Okay. So it's like a, a mini um, table. Uh, from Richard, with your TAM Samsung, what steps can you take to protect yourself against your own biases of your product or service in doing your research to achieve more objective results? Ooh. Well, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, so you can do stuff like submit it to us to have a look and see if it makes sense to us. Do you have other advisors that you can ask if it makes sense? There we go. Like patent searches, will they give us a list or actually do research? Uh, I'm assuming he's referring, uh, Benjamin's referring to the uh, yeah. researchers that he mentioned. Yes. So um, Tara from UNR, she actually is the patent librarian. So if you ask her to do a patent search, she can help you with that as well. Um, when it comes to Patrick at UNLV and Eric, the quality of your question is going to dictate the quality of the information you get out. If you ask very broad questions, it's very difficult to get to Tam and Sam. You can get to Tam relatively easily, but Sam, you have to ask refining questions so that the, the data gets filtered down to what your available market is. So I've referred people to Patrick in the past and he's like, that that person didn't even understand what they were what market they were trying to penetrate and it was a person who was trying to develop an app but he hadn't decided what the features in the app were and what the app was going to do so he couldn't ask good enough questions about who his customers would be so do some thinking about that and then patrick is very helpful so he would and so is eric he would ask more refining questions for you so that you can try to define your customer base a little better. We've got one question in the room and then we'll go back to the chat. Ooh, good question. Maggie, do you need price in the competitive table? No. The no, and the example we had in there, actually we had two different examples, one with actual prices, and that's where you have to be careful and check your pricing often. Uh, because, you know, investors in a pitch will actually look at the phone and see if they can find out what the price is. And if anything in your deck looks hinky, you've got like a strike against you. So if you're going to actually put prices in, then make sure that you're checking them often. Uh, the other way it was depicted was with a number of dollar signs. So one dollar sign indicating less expensive than two dollar signs or three dollar signs. Would we require, would investors require that you have that price comparison row in the competitive matrix? No, I don't think it's required, but if you got further with the investors, they will want to know that you understand who your competition is and what they're charging and how you're different. If you have a more complete solution, then you can charge more. So it's not necessarily a direct, like I'm the cheapest, so I'm the best. You have to be able to know what your competition is doing and justify your price. I would say if, if pricing is a factor for, if you're, if it's pretty same pricing all across the board, maybe not, but if you're very, very different pricing is a competitive component. Absolutely. Um, uh, from Robert, in the rack up, are we basically comparing pain points? Uh, how many rows are too many? What if we have 10 plus competitors and that's too many columns? Do I combine those or I just select a few market leaders? Well, all right. So my warning was make sure that if somebody does a search that you've got those people in there. Um, you can also group your competitors. So you could have like one line that kind of groups a few competitors together if you do have a lot. If you have 10 competitors to start and you don't have a differentiator that makes it clear that you're going to beat all of them, then maybe you shouldn't be pursuing that business idea. So um, how, many, how many different features or differentiators do you need? Um, it is hard to absorb more than five or six of them. So I would pick the most important ones. From, from Rick, thank you, Maggie, great summary. 
I think we hit all the questions. If those in the room or online have any, oh, one more. Uh, reference, Rick, I will send that to you as, uh, right now. I'll send you the example, sli uh, example slide. Uh, well, so Rick, sli actually, you know, slide deck will come out on Sunday, won't it? Yeah, if, if this a link to this deck will be included in the follow up to this session. Um, but we also have a sample pitch deck and Logan can send that. Actually, you know what, Cara, let's just include a link to that deck as well, which covers the things that we like to see in a pitch deck. It goes beyond Tam Sam Som and competition. It's your business model, your problem solutions, all the stuff. And with that, while well, everyone's getting their final questions in, um, uh, thank you all for joining us, both in, in person and online. Uh, after today's session, we will be taking a break for the next two weeks to resume on June 1st with Michael Lofton and Michael Jacobs, who will, Michael Jacobs, who will cover sales. So this is a, you know, product is a, is very important and your service is very important, but sales is is arguably almost more important in uh, you know making the uh, driving up revenue. So please join us for that. That'll be a very important session. But again, in two weeks on June 1st.